If you will turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of 1 Timothy as we continue our study through the Word. Now, as we come to this book, 1 Timothy, it is the first of three letters that are written that are known as the pastoral epistles. We're going to have this first letter of Timothy. It's going to be followed by a second letter to Timothy. And then we have a third letter that is going to go to Titus. Both Timothy and Titus are young men. They are pastors. And so Paul, the aged apostle now, when he is writing these letters, he is looking across the span of his entire ministry as he has been developing Timothy and Titus in his ministry and has now placed them as pastors uh, to be able to lead the churches. And so these letters we are going to find are going to be intimate. They are going to be personal, different than the letters that are written to the church churches, dealing with general church affairs. This is going to be more discipleship based counsel on leading the church and working through the various different issues. At the same time, it's going to be very exhortive because Timothy and Titus are young men. And whenever you are exhorting the young into leadership, they are going to have to be encouraged. It is a scary thing to be ministering to people that are older than you. And on top of that, one of Timothy's personality traits is he's timid to begin with. And so Paul is going to have to exhort him into the authority authority of God's word, the teaching them God's word. Now, when Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, Timothy is in Ephesus. You'll remember that Paul founds Ephesus and then Ephesus flourishes and that church explodes. The whole province, the Roman province of Asia is really evangelized out of the church that is in Ephesus. So Ephesus becomes a very powerful hub church. When Paul is leaving it, and now the scholars debate between whether or not he's leading it after the establishment uh, of it and the visit that he makes and departs from there, or it is also possible that it is written after Paul gets out of prison. There is a tradition that Paul got released out of prison, that he goes and makes a visit to Ephesus, then he is rearrested uh, and then executed. And so it is possible that when Paul is leaving Ephesus after his uh, first imprisonment in Rome, that this is, could, could be when he is writing this letter to Timothy, who he is leaving behind. But what has happened is that in that church, some false doctrine has entered in. And as Paul needs to depart from Ephesus, he is concerned that the elders of the church aren't quite strong enough to be able to deal with the influx of the false doctrine that is coming in. And so what he does is he leaves Timothy behind. And then this is a letter that he writes to him, exhorting him now in his work that is going on there in Ephesus. And so it is going to be rich in exhortation and in intimacy and there is wonderful instruction for our own hearts and our lives as we come to the first of these pastoral epistles so chapter 1 verse 1 first timothy and it says paul an apostle of jesus christ by the commandment of god our savior and the lord jesus christ our hope once again, the format for letters back then was to identify yourself first with your name and then with the description and then who you were writing to and, and a salutation and then into the body. So Paul begins, Paul, and then his identification, an apostle uh, of Jesus Christ. That an apostle means one who is sent on behalf of another. And so Paul was sent on behalf of Christ Jesus. That's his identity. That's who Paul is. Paul, an apostle, one who was sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ. And 
And as I thought about that for a minute, if you and I were to be writing a letter in this format today, and you would begin with your name and then a description of who you are, what would you put? How would you identify yourself? What is it your identity that you would want others to know you by? Now, for some, it might be in what you do. It might be your career. You know, Tom, a, a teacher at Calvary Chapel Green Valley. Or it could be uh, Helen, a wife and mother of so-and-so. And, and so what, what is it? How would you define yourself? Many times in the world today, Identities are built around who they are, who they, what they do in their life, their careers and, uh, and all. But I want you to know what is dangerous about that. What's dangerous about building your identity around what you do is once you stop doing that, who are you? When you're a teacher and that's what your identity is, that's who you are, what happens when you retire? Who are you now when you no longer do what you have developed into your identity? You see, as a believer, our identity isn't in what we do. Our identity is in Christ Jesus. We are children of the Most High God. We are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our identity. And with an identity, no matter where you go, you still have your identity. If your identity is a school teacher and they lock you in prison, who are you now? But if your identity is a child of God, a servant of God, no matter where you are, there you are. You haven't lost your identity. Many times when people retire from their profession, they lose their identity. They don't know who they are anymore when they're no longer doing what they've always done. But when your identity is as a child of God and a servant of the Most High God, then wherever you are, you always know who you are. And so Paul, through the lens, he is a child of God, servant of God. How is he serving God? He's serving now with the post of apostle. But should the Lord recommission him to anything else, Paul would be happy to serve the Lord in whatever capacity God is calling him. And so our identity, your identity, my identity needs to be established in Christ Jesus, uh, who you are in Christ. So Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting that he says, by the commandment of God, our Savior. Normally, when you read the letters that Paul writes, he always says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. But here we see it, it's not by the will of God, it's by the commandment of God. Much stronger term than just by the will of God. And here we see that Paul talking to Timothy, who is a, a fellow servant of him, he says that the Lord commanded him to become an apostle. Now, that goes back to when Paul got saved. Do you remember how Paul was tearing up the church in Jerusalem and then he's on the road to Damascus and suddenly he, he now comes into contact with this confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory of the Lord is so bright, is so powerful that it knocks him down on his face and he's blinded for three days. And you'll remember that, that the Lord says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul answers, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. And so he is confronted by the risen Lord. And then he is commanded by the Lord that he is going to be sent out as an apostle to the Gentiles. And, and, and he is told that it's not going to be easy, that he is going to suffer great hardship. And so Paul was underneath orders as a commander would now order a soldier that, to go and to plant the churches and to do the work uh, of the ministry. And so Paul was commanded by the Lord to go and to build the church among the Gentiles. So he was commanded of the, by, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ to our hope. The Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. I was thinking about hope. 
and how we hope for so many different things. I'm hoping today that it's not hotter outside than my barbecue later on uh, <laughs> is. You know, I'm hoping for good vacation this uh, summertime. I have hopes for my children and their education and their life and their force. And we have all of these hopes, these things that we are looking forward to, these positive blessings that, and that are hopes in our life. What are some of your hopes that you've got in your own life, the things that you're looking to? But then all of the hopes that we have are eclipsed by the horizon with which is our great and glorious hope because that hope is that when we finish this finish line, when we cross over, when we breathe our last breath, that what's waiting for us is the glory of heaven. Is that awesome or is that awesome? I mean, and that... Uh, that is the hope that we live with. So our whole life, we have this great hope that's waiting for us, this great glory of God's presence. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more disappointments, no more aches or pains, no, no the glory of the Lord. Jesus Christ is our hope. And this is why we are the most joyful people on, uh, on the entire planet because our whole life is lived in between today, right now, and the glory that is waiting for us. And so here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, living now as a, being sent by the command of God, but living and waiting for the hope of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ to our Lord. So it's addressed to Timothy, and Timothy is there in uh, Ephesus now, and he is writing this. Now, Timothy, you'll remember, we first encounter Timothy in Acts chapter 16. Now, Paul, on his first missionary journey, they head out from the church in Antioch, and, and they go through Galatia, and they come to Lystra. It was in Lystra that we see Timothy gets saved on his first missionary journey. He is the son of a Jewish woman who's married to a Greek man. The Jewish mother of a Timothy gets saved along with Timothy on that first missionary journey that Paul goes on. Now, on his second missionary journey, a couple years later, Paul ends up traveling back and tracing the same route that he took when visiting the same churches uh, that he visited on the first time. So he comes into Lystra. And here is this young man, Timothy, and he is just on fire for the Lord. He has a great reputation, not only in Lystra, but also in Iconium, in the surrounding area. And he is just this young man that continues to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul perceives that there's a call on his life. And in the middle of his second missionary trip, during his stop in Lystra, he invites this young man, two years in the Lord, to come and to join the missionary team. And so we see Timothy joins Paul on that second missionary trip as he comes through Lystra. And Paul, from that moment on, becomes uh, the mentor over Timothy. He continues to develop him and to raise uh, him up. He's a true son in the faith, he says here. He is, he, he is the father, the spiritual dad to Timothy, and he grows him up and mentors him, and now he's placing him there in uh, Ephesus. It says, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, normally, again, in the epistles that Paul writes to the churches, you always find that it is grace and peace. These are the twin towers of the greeting. Uh, always, we first experience the grace of God. This is how we then know the peace of God. But in between grace and peace, here when he's writing to another pastor, when he's writing to a pastor, he inserts mercy. And the reason is, is because pastors need mercy. I'm telling you right now, we need mercy. When we're dealing with the, the conflict uh, that is within the congregation, when we're dealing with the marital problems and the family problems, when we are dealing with the doctrinal problems and the behavioral problems, we need 
need mercy. We need the help of God and the mercy of God in our lives as we are seeking to, uh, to lead congregations. And, uh, and so here we see grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. So here we see this is where uh, he is declaring for Timothy to remain there in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. There were these other doctrines that were coming into the church. And so Paul is trying to keep them focused on the pure word and on the doctrine that they had been established in. In verse 4 he says, Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now remember the early church. Remember that it's made up of the Gentiles and of the Jews that had converted. Now with the Jews, remember that they were all about their genealogies and so-and-so begot so-and-so who begot so-and-so and, and they kept all of the genealogies so that you could keep track of which tribe you were from and they had all of these registered and recorded. So. Here we see that within the church now, within the Jews who were now Christians, they were still carrying on about the genealogies. Are you a Levite? Are you from the tribe of Judah? And so there was all of this genealogy stuff that was going on that was brought in by the Jews. Now on the other side, there were the Greeks, the Gentiles. And so the Gentiles had all of their fables and their stories and, and their traditions and all of that. And so now both of these were bringing in and mixing into the doctrine of the new covenant of the church. And so what was happening is it was creating all of these disputes that were going on. So when everybody is disputing, what are they not doing? They're not studying the word of God. And so they had gotten distracted from the word of God. And so Paul is reminding Timothy, Timothy, get the chatter out. Cut away from the peripheral and what is distracting and build them up in the true word of God. And so in verse 5, he says, now the purpose of the commandment is love. From a pure heart, from a good conscience and from sincere faith. And so what does he do? He points them back to the word of God. And when you look at the word of God, if you were to condense the word of God into one single word, that word would be love. This is what the book is all about. God is love. That's who he is. That's his DNA. That's what he is made of. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves his creation. God loves mankind. We've been separated by sin, and God has been reclaiming mankind from the fall, a story of redemption and uh, of now a reconnection back together with God. It's a love story from one end to the other. God is love. God loves you. And God is seeking to draw you into a deeper, more abiding love relationship with him. And so here we see that Paul is reminding Timothy, make sure that you focus the congregation on love. He says, love from a pure heart. Now, a pure heart different types of hearts, but a pure heart is a heart that's chasing after God. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, mind, and strength. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When we wake up in the morning to pursue our relationship with God, this is the most important thing that we do in our day, in our life, is living in that conscious awareness of God's presence in our life, keeping an intimate, ongoing relationship pursuing him, a pure heart. He says, love with a pure heart. And then he says, a good conscience. A good conscience isn't, uh, that doesn't come from being perfect. We know that there's no one that's perfect, but a good conscience means that you are open to a dialogue with God about anything that's going on in your life versus closing off the areas of your life that, that you don't want to have a conversation with God about. 
having a, a good conscience means that, that you have owned your sins, whatever sins that you are, you've confessed them, that, that you've asked God for forgiveness, and you've repented. That means that you've turned away from those sins, and you have determined not to repeat them. Now you're open before God. You are authentically connected to him. Bad conscience. Think of Adam and Eve and how after they had sinned, when God now comes walking through the garden, but where are they? They're hiding from God because sin makes you want to pull away from God and, uh, and makes you want to run away. That's not having a good conscience before God. And so chasing after God, owning your own sin and confessing it and receiving the forgiveness of sin so that you are open and free before God, that every part of your life, every action in your life, you are ready to submit and have a conversation with God on anything, that you're not hiding anything, you've confessed everything and you're free, and you're free. That's how God wants you to live, completely free, completely transparent with him and open, a good conscience and sincere faith. Now, the word for sincere means to not be a hypocrite, without hypocrisy, a faith without hypocrisy. And so what does that speak of? It speaks of, you know, when we're trying to pretend that we're holier than we really are. Here's the bottom line. We are one messed up group of sinners. Amen? You know, I mean, that's who we are. We are washed in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is none righteous. No, not one of us. We're all just trying to allow the Holy Spirit to keep molding us into the image and likeness of Christ. And so here we see that we're not supposed to try and pretend like we're further along in the process than we are. Just be who you are. It, it's enough. You are who you are. And, and that's where you are in your process, in your relationship with God, so that we don't have to put on airs and pretenses and all and put masquerades on and pretend that we're something that, that we're not. We're not a museum of saints, church. We're a hospital for sinners, amen? I mean, we come in, we've got bandages and broken, and we're, we're getting patched up and then stuck back in the battle for a week and come on back in and we'll change out the bandages and get back out there and, uh, and keep doing our best and keep doing our best. God wants us to be real. He wants us to be real with him. He wants us to be real with one another. We don't have to pretend love. That's what the Word of God is about. With a pure heart, with a good conscience, without any pretending. Just pursue your relationship with God. Just surrender yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit in, in your life and let God's love fill your heart, overflow you, and, and love others. He says in verse 6, talking about our faith, he says, for which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. So here again, what we have is the Judaizers. Now this is the Jews, and, and one of the great problems that the Jews had is that their whole life they grew up underneath the law. They grew up underneath the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. But now they have entered into the New Covenant. They've entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But there were those that said, yes, we're saved by Christ, but we still have to keep the law. And they kept trying to drag the law into the church. Now, I want you to know the church is the new covenant and the law is the old covenant. And so there is no place for the law to be dragged into the new covenant, into the church. And so this was a constant battle for the Jews and also for Paul to help them to understand that they're not underneath the law any longer. When you've lived your whole life one way, you become comfortable with that. And so this was a difficult transition for them. Now, some of the Judaizers who were trying to bring the law in, Paul says that, uh, that, that they were wanting to be teachers. Now, a teacher of the law, the Jewish term for teacher of the law is a rabbi. 
So the rabbis, remember, they were highly respected by the people. So these uh, Judaizers, they were wanting that same type of a platform in the church. They wanted that same type of respect uh, of uh, the law. And he says, of those that are trying to bring the law into the church, he says, they don't understand the law. They don't understand what they're saying, nor the things that are in the law. Now, after Paul says that there's no place for the law in the church, Look at what he says in verse 8. He says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now, Paul's not putting down the law. He's just saying we're not underneath the law. There's nothing the matter with the law. But the law was for the old covenant, and we're in the new covenant. So he says you have to remember to use the law in the proper way. Now, what was the improper way? The improper way to use the law was to make a person feel justified by the law. You see, here was the purpose of the law. Underneath the old covenant, God defined his moral conduct. Here is the moral conduct. And he lays it down and he spells it out. Now, when we measure our life against the moral conduct that God set forth, this is what we end up saying. Yikes. <laughs> I'm in trouble. That, that should be our response when we see God's law and then we measure our life. It's like, I have fallen short of this standard. And that was the purpose of the law, was to make every single person go, yikes. I'm in trouble with God. Now, God had the solution for us, but that was the purpose. But here's what the Jews did. Here's what the Pharisees did. They said, well, no one's perfect. No one can keep all of it, but whoever keeps more of it than anybody else, they're righteous and before God. So they had a giant contest with each other, saying whoever kept more of it, they're righteous. Well, that's an unlawful use of the law. That's the wrong purpose because you should never feel like, yeah, I'm in good standing with God because I'm not sinning as much as you, you big sinner over there, you know? Uh, and, 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 and so here we see that Paul says, look, there's nothing the matter with the law. The law is good, but as long as you use it properly. Now look at this next statement because this is a key verse. He says, verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but, and now here's a list of sins, for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. Wow, that's a list of sins uh, right there that we've got in verse 9. But I want to go back to that first part because it says this, knowing that the law is not made for a righteous person. Now, who's a righteous person? The Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. But, wait a minute. Once we are saved, what happens? We are washed in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and now we have the righteousness of Christ that is upon us. We are a believer. It says that the law is not for a believer. That's what it's saying. The law was never intended for the righteous person, someone that has already reconciled their sin with God, been washed and forgiven, and is good standing with them. The law was to create the yikes, was to create the awareness of sin in your life. Once you have accepted Jesus Christ, once you've been washed, you're now righteous. You have the righteousness of Christ in your life. So what's Paul saying? The law is not meant for the church. The law is not meant for believers. The law is not meant for Christians. The law is not meant for the righteous. He says, but for all of these lawbreakers. And he starts to list all of these sins. Now in verse 10, he keeps on going with this list of sins. And then I love it. Then he does an ollie ollie oxen free, you know, at the end. He's like, I'm not going to list every single possible sin, you know, that there is. I'm just choosing a few, listing them out. And then he gives an all call. Verse 10, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. There it is. Any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, that uh, now this is who the law is for. Now, notice that there's two sexual sins that are here, fornicators and sodomites. That's for fornicators. Fornicators, that's a man and a woman. 
outside of marriage, having sex outside of marriage. Now, sodomite, that is two homosexuals having sex outside of the boundaries that God has called for. God gave sex as a gift to a man and a woman bonded together underneath the covenant of marriage. Sex outside of that is wrong. Whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, it doesn't matter. God has reserved in sexuality in the exchange of sexual pleasure to be confined within the marriage and covenant. And so if a, a man and a woman are dating and having sex, that's fornication. And that we see is, is wrong just as homosexual sex is wrong. And so here we see that sexual sin is an equal opportunity, you know, condemner here by God of sex outside of marriage. It's not the unforgivable sin. But it is a sin, and it's considered to be wrong by God's moral standards, as he expresses here. In verse 11, he says, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So, once again, what he is telling them is the word of God, the gospel, the good news. This is how we measure, this is the standard by which we measure our conduct. Now, in verse 12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So this is another key verse, verse 12. Paul was put into the ministry, but he was enabled by God for the ministry that he was put into. Whenever God calls you into any type of ministry whatsoever, with the calling itself goes the enablement by God to be able to do what God is calling you to do. Now, God never asks you to do it on your own. And apart from his enablement, you will not be able to be successful in what God is calling you to do to the standard that God desires you to be. I think about Paul. And Paul, when you look at what he went through in his ministry, he was enabled by God to keep on going. He's shipwrecked. He's beaten. He's imprisoned. I mean, the man is unbelievable. He is giving a sermon. The people get so angry, they stone him drag him out of the city, dead, leaves him for dead. The Lord resurrects him. And what does he do? He goes back in to finish his sermon from the people that just stoned him. To Who does that? That's the enablement of God. That's the power of God. That's why Paul was able to do the things that he did and continue to keep on going. He was enabled by the power of God. And that same power of God that enabled Paul and his ministry is available to each and every one of us in the things that we have been called to. Husbands, you've been called by God to love your wives sacrificially. And without even knowing your wives, I know that that's impossible to do without uh, the enablement, the empowerment uh, uh, of God. Don't laugh too much, ladies. You're next. <laughs> <laughs> and ladies, wives, you've been called uh, by God to love uh, your husbands sacrificially and i know some of them and i know how hard that has to be for you guys uh, to love them sacrificially but you cannot do that you can't love them sacrificially in and of your own strength that takes an enablement uh, of god the power of god in your life Youth, if you're living underneath your parents' home and underneath their authority, you've been called by God to honor and respect your parents. And that's a hard thing to do when, when you're starting to grow and you want your independence and you want to start to assert yourself. But with the grace of God, with the enablement of God, you are able to do that. Whatever God calls you to, singleness, if you're single right now, God will give you the enablement, listen, to live single, to live single. You may be wanting that special person, that spouse, that, uh, that guy or that girl, and there can be this discontent, but God can give you the enablement for the season that you're in to be able to live out 
your life in a godly fashion. When you read the word of God and you see the, the conduct that God describes before us, we can't do that in our own strength. We can't do that in our own power, in the power of the flesh. That needs to be the work of the Spirit. That's the enablement of God. So whatever season you find yourself, whatever situation, whatever God has called you to, with that, he will give you that enablement. But you have to call upon that enablement. And you have to learn how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit that is available and not just leave it sitting there next to you, unused, doing it in your own strength. Because when you do that, you are going to fall, fall short of what God wants for you and the quality of the life that was available to you. You were made and created for victory in Christ Jesus. Amen? And we can live that victorious life. He never sets you up to fail. He never calls you to what you cannot succeed. And with it, he gives you the resources right alongside of every single calling. Paul was this amazing apostle, but he says, hey, it wasn't because I was something special. He says, I was enabled by God. He points the glory to God. I was enabled by God because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although, verse 13, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. So I did it ignorantly. Paul here declares that he was opposed to Christ, but that he did it in in ignorance. He didn't know what he was doing. Do you remember Jesus' prayer on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they, they know not what they're doing. And Paul was one of the very people that Jesus was praying for. They do not know what they are doing. He says, In the grace of our Lord, Lord verse 14, was exceedingly abundant, with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. His sin was great, but the grace of God was greater. And this is what he came to the recognition. This is a faithful saying, verse 15, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul couldn't believe that God could forgive him for all of his sins. Here he was, working against the church, tearing it up and seeking to destroy the building of the kingdom of God that Jesus came to establish and to build forth. And when he suddenly realized, when he had that road to Damascus encounter with the Lord, that he had been directly opposing God and tearing up what God was planting and building, he was like, what is worse than that? What sin is worse than destroying the work that God is doing here upon the earth? And he said, I am the chief among all sinners. And yet God's grace extended even to me. But then, he's like, but then God would use me? God would pick me, the greatest offender, to then be used to build the kingdom of God? And and Paul tried to process that and reconcile that during the course of his life. And here's Paul at the end of his life now when he's writing this letter to Timothy. And he's got perspective. He's got perspective. Young people, listen to the old people. Because here's what happens with, with old age, so, so I've heard, is, is that you, you, you <laughs> I'm learning <laughs> faster than I want to learn. Anyways, you get perspective. You get perspective. You see, when you're in the middle of it, you can't really see that perspective when you're right in the midst of it. But as you get older and you get past and you can look back at it, you can get the perspective now to put it in the right balance. Here's Paul at the end of his life. He can't believe that God forgave him. He can't believe that God put him into perspective, put him into the ministry. He said, I'm the chief among sinners. I know that about myself. Why would God do that? Why would God save me and then put me in the ministry when I'm the worst of the worst? And he says in verse 16, here, here it is. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy. He says, I've got it. I understand it now. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering 
as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. The long suffering of Christ and his mercy towards me, who is the worst of the worst, you know what he says? It gives hope for everybody else. <laughs> Because there might be those that feel like, man, God can't forgive me. Look at everything that I've done in my life. And Paul says, yeah, you weren't tearing up the church. <laughs> you weren't destroying the kingdom of God. Your sin may be black, but it's not as black as my sin. And God forgave me. And God not only forgave me, he also used me as an apostle. God can use anybody. God can save anybody. Amen? And Paul says, that is why he chose me. I'm the end uh, of the spectrum right there so that everybody else is inside the end of that spectrum and there's hope for every single person on the face of the earth. That's perspective. That's something that doesn't come in the heat of the moment, but that is now a lifetime uh, being able to look back. And so he has that perspective. And as he just comes to grips with the grace that he has received, his sin was great, God's grace was greater, he just busts out now into this little spiritual dance. Uh, you hear this doxology in the next uh, verse, verse 17. A doxology, that's just a big theological word that means a praise for God when you just praise God. And so he breaks out into this praise, into this moment of just recognizing how good God is. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And he just busts out in this glorious uh, praise right in the middle of his letter. He just kind of stops writing to Timothy, busts out a praise, and then uh, on to verse 18. Now he's talking to Timothy, picking it back up. This charge I commit to you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. He's telling Timothy in Ephesus, I know it's going to be hard, but you've got to fight the good fight. You've got to wage the good warfare. And, and, and he's encouraging him in the prophecies that were prayed over him. Now somewhere there was a prophecy that was prayed over him. It may have been when when Paul is first taking Timothy on that missionary journey with him, and they were praying over Timothy on his departure, and there may have been a prophecy over him. Some believe that it could have been when he was being established as a pastor, praying over uh, him and his ordination. There was this prophecy that was given. But somewhere there was a prophecy maybe about being bold or that he was going to be a pastor of great influence or whatever. But suddenly there was this prophecy that was prayed over, and there is now the recollection of that prophecy. I'm reminded of Pastor Chuck. When Pastor Chuck first took over the church at Costa Mesa, it was small. It was like 30 or, uh, or 40 people. It was just a small group uh, of men and women of believers. And Pastor Chuck felt like God was calling him to go and to pastor. It didn't make a lot of sense with just 30 or 40, but God felt like that was the next move. And they were in a prayer meeting. It was a Sunday night prayer meeting. It was only a handful of them. Uh, and in the middle of the prayer meeting, suddenly there was a prophecy of, thus saith the Lord, that Pastor Chuck is going to become a shepherd of shepherds and that he will pastor pastors. Uh, and this was the prophecy now that was prophesied over Pastor Chuck. The end of the prayer service, I mean, there was still a small church. He says the next week nothing happened. It didn't explode. He says, I think a couple people left the church, in fact. Uh, <laughs> but Pastor Chuck went on to, uh, to be the, the leader of the Calvary Chapel movement, and I had the privilege of attending some of those senior pastor conferences where Pastor Chuck was speaking to not only hundreds, but there were over a thousand pastors of congregation, senior pastors, that he was now pastoring the pastors that went all the way back to a little tiny prayer meeting when there had been a prophecy that was given mm, over Pastor Chuck. Here we see that there was a prophecy, there was an utterance of the Spirit over Timothy about something that God was going to do future. And Paul is here reminding Timothy of that utterance. Remember that prophecy now as, as it was becoming uh, fulfilled here. 
He says in verse 19, having faith and a good conscience with which some have rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck of who are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So he says, have faith and a good conscience. He says, some have, have strayed. They have held on to false doctrine. And Alexander and Hymenaeus, we're going to find out in the second chapter that Hymenaeus was teaching a false doctrine. He was teaching that the resurrection of the dead had already occurred. That's something that the Jehovah's Witnesses, a false doctrine that the Jehovah's Witnesses to this day hold to. But Paul, when he confronted on him, he wouldn't change his doctrine. So what did he do is he stepped him out of the church so that he wouldn't bring confusion and disunity. And now when you're outside of the church, he says he turned him over to Satan. That's another term for being outside of the protection of the fellowship of believers. Now, the goal was twofold. Number one, to keep the divisiveness from infecting the body. But secondly, uh, that correction would happen, that repentance would happen, and he would then be allowed to come back into fellowship. And so it wasn't punitive. Uh, it was instead uh, remedial and seeking to help us to all walk together in one accord. As we close now our study here on this first chapter, I want to draw our attention for just a minute back to verse 13. And in verse 13, he says, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, he says, I obtained mercy. He says, because I was formerly... And, and that got me to thinking. I was formerly, and each and every one of us could fill that in ourselves for our own lives. I was formerly dot, dot, dot. Who were you formerly? Who were you formerly before you met Christ? What did you look like? What was your life look like? And so here is Paul's dot, dot, dot of who he was formerly, but now he encountered the mercy of God, and this is who he is today. And that change, that delta from who we were to who we are now, that's called the grace of God in our life. Amen? That is what God has done in the working of God in our life. That's God's glory in our own life that becomes our personal testimony. And so I, I remember that, uh, that in the school of ministry, when we were in the school of ministry, that one of the assignments that we had was to write out our testimony, a 20-minute testimony, so that if you were to stand up and to speak for 20 minutes, talking about you begin with your spiritual upbringing, you were born, what your, your, the, the history of your spirituality was, and then when you met Christ and, and the coming to Christ, and then the highlights of what's happened in your life and the way that your life has changed since you've met Christ and, and all for the glory of God. That's... That's your testimony. That's 20 minutes and designed to just give credit to God for the things that God has done in your life. You're testifying to God's goodness that you've experienced personally in your own life. So we did that. We wrote that out. And then when we got those back, they then said, okay, now take that and turn it into a five-minute testimony. And so we reduced it. If you only had five minutes, if you were standing at a bus stop waiting for a bus, it was going to come in five minutes. <laughs> you could give your testimony at the uh, occasion. To... So uh, we got those back. And then they said, okay, now take your five minute and turn it into a 60 second testimony. If you're standing in the supermarket and you're at the checkout line, you got 60 seconds and someone uh, is interested in your testimony that in 60 seconds uh, that you can talk about the goodness and the grace of God in your life that you've personally experienced and give your testimony to God. Now, here's the interesting thing. People can argue about anything and everything, and they do today, especially on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all of the different noise and the voices and opinions that are out there. And, but here's one thing that they cannot argue with you on is what God has done in your life. There is no argument for it. It's just simply the testimony of the goodness of God in your own life. The Bible says to be ready in season and out, to give a reason for the hope that lies within us, to give a reason. The reason is our testimony of what we have experienced, to be ready in season and out of season. Now, notice something else. It says to give an answer. <laughs> an answer means that somebody asked a 
question versus just running around blabbering your testimony to people who don't want to hear your testimony. That's, that's different uh, than when that invitation, when the Lord taps you and says, go, you're on, share, but being ready. Here Paul is writing out his brief testimony, who he was, the grace of God, and who he is now. May we be ready in season and out to tell others when asked, when the opportunity allows itself to give a reason for what God has done in your heart and all glory be to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. And Lord, we don't have to invent a testimony. You're writing it. You're creating it. You're building it. Help us to not pretend that we're more than who we are. Help us to just love you with a pure heart, with a good conscience, Lord, with a sincere faith. And Father, may you fill us afresh, overflow us, continue to change us, Lord, and help us to love others. Help us, Lord, to to pick up and to use the enablement that you've given to us in everything that you've called us to do. To you be all glory and honor and praise forever and ever.